interested as well. Um, so you've you've had my introduction. You don't need it. The only thing I sort of point out there is that if you uh, if you want is um, is my Twitter Twitter handle um, for those of you who do Twitter. We try and pump out our papers on Twitter uh, pretty uh, pretty regularly. Um, so in terms of these sources of information, if you want to download any of them, although I think the talk will probably be available, um, um, then yeah, our King Centre for Military Health Research and our Health Protection Research Unit website have most of the papers and they're sort of free to access, but don't tell the journals. Um, it's clear, and, and you just heard a lot about this really, that over the last um, year and a half really now really, um, there's been lots of different stresses affecting people. And I think it's important to recognize that healthcare workers, as well as having particular stresses um, at work, are also part of general society. So they've been through um, all the rest of it. Um, and you know, many may have unfortunately suffered bereavements and there's may have been financial difficulties um, and in loved ones uh, and also you know education and all those other things but there is this particular topic which is called moral injury which I think has great relevance to uh, what's gone on over the last um, 18 months and I'm going to present some of the data we have uh, on that uh, in just a little bit um, although that data is not much of it's not yet published and um, so moral injury at its heart describes a situation in which your moral or ethical code is, is violated or a kind of transgression of it. Now that all sounds a little bit complicated, um, but what it really means is that actually you find yourself in a situation where you're thinking, you know, did I do the right thing? Um, did someone else do the right thing? Did I feel let down? And we often term that moral distress. That's often reversible. It's there for a little while. We experience distress for lots of reasons, including morally. Moral injury describes the bit where those symptoms, often anger, shame, or guilt, become embedded and they don't go away just by themselves and so by themselves they are not a mental health disorder you won't find the diagnosis of moral injury in the DSM or the ICD but they can be thought of as a vulnerability factor there's something there nagging away at you um, that can predispose you to become unwell the three ways that you can experience moral injury are either through acts of commission omission or betrayal um, and commission um, you know, mentions uh, things that you or other people should have done. You know, if I told people what I did, they would think I was a monster. They would never think that I was a good commission. Um, acts of omission, you know, I should have done things. I, I, other people didn't do things. I just stood by, I just watched it happen. And then feeling let down by people who, who really should have looked out for you. Often, often a higher authority, the, the, the people above your supervisors, but also at times also your colleagues and your friends. Uh, and, and people not being interested in you or, or denying that things happened when, when clearly they did. The relevance of moral injury particularly is that when we look at this in association with mental health, we find that there are strong links to post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, to depression, and also to suicidality uh, as well. Um, and um, when we try and look at moral injury, it, because it's a relatively uh, new field, although the, the topic's been around for years and years, particularly first discussed back at the time of the Vietnam War in great detail, there are lots of different ways of looking at it. So we've used a scale which is pretty well um, recognized now, which is called the MISE, which is the Moral Injury Event Scale. And this is looking at, at the events, the exposures that may go on to cause moral injury. And I've, I've uh, put it in three different colors there and where you've got acts of commission, acts of omission, and then feelings of betrayal. Uh, and those are the three different types of moral injury exposures um, that we have, have measured. So this is, comes from a study we're running uh, at um, uh, King's College London, although in collaboration with UCL uh, as well, we've got some great uh, colleagues there. Um, and this is looking at um, exposure to moral injury and mental health impact. And, the study called NHS Check has about 26,500 staff in it across the NHS in England. Uh, it's not just clinicians, it's all different sorts of staff. And um, what we did here is to split into low, moderate and high exposure to morally injurious events or potentially morally injurious events. And you can see here, we've got four different ways of looking at mental health. Uh, the last one here is the PTSD measure. And what this shows really well, I think, is that moral injury is a relevant topic uh, for healthcare workers, because what you see here is it's the people who have the highest exposure to these potentially morally injurious events that have the worst mental health. And you can see that, you know, there, there really is almost a doubling 
uh, poor mental health is when you go from having some exposure to having a lot of exposure. When you put this, uh, looking at a different way, and, and, and please just sort of hear, burnout's been mentioned as well, is you can see here again, this is uh, low, medium and high. It's the high uh, exposed, the most exposed people who have the most significant uh, proportion of, of symptoms. And it, it's important to say, say that our NHS check, like many other studies that are mentioned, are self-report studies. And therefore, we need to be cautious in not um, thinking that if we see a high score on a self-report scale, that necessarily means that we have lots of very ill people. We're actually doing a study now where we are interviewing people in a lot of detail to actually identify what proportion of these high scorers actually have an illness. And it won't surprise you to know it's a lot less than comes out on, on the self-report questionnaires. And so um, here you can see that PTSD probably is the uh, strongest link uh, with morally injurious events, which very much fits into our, our systematic review and meta-analysis in the BJ sites from time ago. Um, here we've got uh, a, a, a big chart, and, and please forgive me, I, I know it's uh, sometimes hard to, to see all these things. This is looking at who's most at risk, and what we see here is that um, actually it's, it's men, it's nurses, it's single people, it's people who have a non-white um, ethnicity, people who, um, whose role during the, uh, the pandemic has changed, so they've been something different in the, in the healthcare role, having more contact with patients. And I think the last piece here, you can just about see on my screen, is that actually it's feeling certainly early on that they had inadequate PPE, which fits very well with this idea of feeling let down by people who should have been looking after you. And this comes out very nicely, I think, in our, our, um, our examination of moral injury, where we find that actually it's acts of betrayal that seem to be the biggest impact in terms of uh, mental health with moral injury. So, you know, so it, it's important to know that actually things I didn't do, maybe people are thinking, well, actually, I, you know, I, I couldn't have done them because it just wasn't possible. One of the good examples of that would be that early on in the pandemic, the Nightingale, for instance, you had one experienced ICU nurse for six beds, six beds and then it was four beds. I mean, normally they work on a one-to-one -one basis. You just can't provide that same level of care. You know, it's just not possible. You cannot be in four or six places at once, but it's feeling let down that were by others, that was the most impactful. And I think that's important in thinking about what we do about this going forward. Um, one thing that has come out quite nicely from the data is looking about the impact of, of support uh, and our relationships with others and how that relates to the experience of moral injury. And you can see here that if you felt you didn't have a good support from your managers, you were substantially more likely to experience um, what happened to you as, as potentially morally injurious. Again, substantially more likely to feel that you didn't, um, uh, you were exposed to morally injurious events if you hadn't got good support from colleagues and indeed from family. And sort of fitting in with that as well as if one of your colleagues um, died from, from COVID, then again, that also uh, made you much more likely to experience what happened to you as morally, uh, morally injurious. And certainly our data that we have from we're going around some, with some colleagues actually from UCL again, um, interviewing uh, staff working in intensive care units. And the real big hit in those intensive care units is having someone in the hospital, particularly someone they knew, come into the intensive care and die. And that, that's been a particularly challenging event you know, because these are people who, you know, I, I, should, I shouldn't have let that happen. This, um, th this looks a bit complicated. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but do, do you... This is looking at the morally uh, demise, the, the scale in particular. And the reason I put this up is you can see at the bottom the different clinical groups um, of uh, different groups, including clinical and non-clinical. And this is just looking about who, who we felt betrayed by. And what this is looking here is you can see for nurses, the biggest betrayal was feeling betrayed by supervisors and managers. So the people who manage my day-to-day -day life, who look after me at work, that was the biggest element of betrayal. Whereas you know, doctors, and to be fair, quite a lot of nurses also felt very strongly betrayed by people outside the health service who they once trusted. Now, we're not at a stage yet, we need to do some more work of knowing who that is. You know, is this the public who carried on acting irresponsibly and, and getting COVID and causing the workload to be high? Is that who they, they, they felt betrayed by? Or is this kind of the government and, um, uh, and, 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 and other organisations outside who should have been looking after me or is it colleagues? So we're not sure yet, but 
But what you can see here is actually the pattern of portrayal seems to vary a bit on your clinical group. And, uh, and, and I think that, that's something that we need to delve down into some more detail because actually the reparative, how do we make this better, very much depends upon who we feel let, let down by. It's all great having your supervisors, you know, try and make good with you at work. But actually, if that's not who you feel let down by, that's not going to affect your experience of, of being morally injured. Um, and if it is about the government, then actually, you know, this, that's at the Chris Whitty, um, Boris Johnson level and something there needs, needs to happen. But you know, we need some more work to, to look at that. What can you do about moral injury, uh, which obviously is important? Um, well, obviously, the best thing is to reduce exposure, um, so not to put people in situations in which moral injury might occur. Very easy to say that, um, but actually very difficult to do. So, you know, if you spoke two years ago, should we put our staff in a situation where they weren't trained and there were too many patients coming in at one time? Everyone would have said no, but when the situation happens, you have to make the best. So reducing exposure is important, but, but there's a degree to which we just can't do that uh, as much as we want. Preparing people properly. So one of the things that uh, we know from the evidence, both from medical staff and medical studies and also from military studies is that people who felt that they were operating in a role that was outside of their normal experience uh, are more at risk of suffering with psychological injuries and, and probably with moral injuries as well. And so what we really need to do is, is to make sure that if you're gonna go into a situation where it is morally ambiguous and it's gonna be morally challenging, that you don't let people deal with those situations for the first time when they're in this situation, that you prepare them beforehand. So for instance, at the Nightingale, we were only operating for a couple of months. What we tried to get across to staff who were coming there and we sort of just about got there towards the time it finished, was that if you're going into this role at working in a, in a big shop floor, it's gonna be hot, it's gonna be difficult to communicate, it's gonna be um, um, sort of unpleasant much of the time and people are gonna die despite your best efforts. Now that's not a very good marketing uh, slogan, I agree, but it actually allows people to begin to get their head around what's going on um, before they actually encounter that for, for real. And certainly in the military, you know, well, I know this might sound a strange thing to do, you know, as, as commanders are leading their troops into situations where they're going to go into battle, they talk about what's going to happen if people die. They talk about what's going to happen if you got shot. Uh, what are you going to do? How are you going to, what's going to happen? How are people, what are you going to expect from your colleagues? Because actually having those frank discussions beforehand, that frank, no nonsense preparatory briefing we think it is likely to be helpful so we need to talk about these difficult topics before they actually occur and then once people have been exposed to morally injurious events despite best efforts to prevent them we need to try and to do some meaning making which for those of you who work with trauma you'll know meaning is a really key part of what trauma is about but it's equally and, and associatively the same with moral injury and what that means is what can we do now? Well, that means we can give staff a proper thank you, you know, getting the, the, the jewels medal, uh, the George Cross you know, yesterday, you know, I'm sure is nice for the health service, but at a more local level, how do you say thank you to members of staff, a proper thank you? That isn't just dear staff member, thank you for your work during COVID, but actually is, is a, it says something about what you've done. And I don't know if you've seen, but there's been some fantastic um, examples of, on Twitter and, and other social media, of great NHS trusts who have written to the families of healthcare workers say, thank you so much for letting your mummy and daddy come to work. I know it's been difficult for you, but they, they're doing a great job and we really appreciate. So bringing the family into this to try and say, actually, we do appreciate the efforts you're putting in. And then the other way of trying to create some meaning is to go through this process, which we call reflective practice that, that many of us kind of do anyway, because that's part of what you have to do for revalidation, to think about what you've done, this is thinking about what we've done, what we've done as a team. And this ideally is led by a supervisor or leader who, who has had a little bit of training, who feels confident, maybe facilitated with a psychological health professional alongside, but not just by a psychological health professional. This is about a team doing this together. And the idea here is as well as talking about what went right and wrong, this is more about talking about what was the impact. What, what actually did, what impact did that have on me? And, this is not so much about people telling their own stories to get it off their own chest. It's about creating an environment in which everybody hears some stories and realizes that actually the stories that they're hearing are very much synergistic with what they experience themselves. And the aim here is to create what we call a meaningful narrative. And that's a story in which it wasn't everyone else's fault and it wasn't my fault. It, it was that we were all in the same storm, even if at times we didn't feel all in the same boat. Um, and what we think, and we need more research work here, is that by creating this meaningful narrative, this story 
which makes some sort of sense despite the chaos that has gone on that actually we help we think that that will derail or prevent moral injuries progressing on to frank mental illness and for those of you who heard of Schwartz round which is an example of, of how you can do this it's not the only way um, there is some evidence albeit weak at the moment that actually Schwartz rounds can help with team functioning and mental health and we, we think from our, our data which at the moment is mostly um, the detailed data is about military personnel that actually creating this meaningful narrative is an important uh, step into trying to resolve moral injuries and preventing them going on and becoming unwell. And of course, we shouldn't forget, and I'm going to go through this kind of briefly now, that actually uh, moral injury is strongly linked with mental health. And therefore, if you protect staff's mental health, you will make a big difference in terms of moral injury. And we know that buddying people up, you know, so actually having a good support at work is really, really important. And that came out earlier on in that slide I showed you about people feeling that if they didn't feel well supported by their colleagues and by their managers, they were much more likely to suffer with moral injury. This is some data from military personnel, and this interestingly is from people who were deployed on peacekeeping operations, which are well known to be morally highly ambiguous situations where often you're prevented from, from doing what you want to protect local civilians by the what are called the rules of engagement. So you can't do what you want. Very much back to healthcare, you know, not being able to deliver the care you wanted to, the high quality care, because the situation didn't allow. And what we know here is that that most people who speak about those events speak about other people who, with other people who have been in the same situation and that having an employee assistance program or healthcare uh, provider outside of your organization is all well and good, but actually most people don't speak to them. They speak to people who are just like them. The most important bit about mental health support, and this very much fits in with the reflective practice piece as well, is making sure that you have supervisors who feel confident to have a psychologically supported conversation really strong evidence from the military and from firefighters that if you get the immediate supervisor so that the person who's managing your day-to-day -day work um, to be able to feel confident to speak to you about mental health problems that makes a, a huge impact on on reporting symptoms and also on sickness absence you know it can lead to a 90 percent reduction there's some really good published evidence on this including a randomized controlled trial uh, carried out in australian firefighters and so we developed a short intervention to try and train up supervisors to feel confident to speak about mental health difficulties, uh, which latterly we've added in an element about moral injury because it's so important. Um, and this, this package that we developed was called REACT, which stood for recognize, engage, actively listen, check the risk, and talk about a specific plan. It was a one hour training package delivered online uh, using Zoom uh, with a bit of didactic teaching, a bit of a demonstration, and then getting people practicing in breakout rooms how to use this REACT template. And, what we did is we did a small study, which we published in Occupational Medicine earlier this year, and this showed that before the training, over half of the supervisors didn't feel confident to speak to, uh, identify and support people who may have mental health difficulties. One month after the training, nearly 85% felt confident. So this is a bite-sized piece of training which upskills supervisors to have those psychologically savvy conversations. Also really good evidence that peer support uh, makes a difference. I won't speak about TRIM in detail. TRIM is a peer support system we developed in, in the military. Um, and it's a way of actively monitoring staff who have been exposed to traumatic events and difficult events to support them. And if that doesn't work, to get them pushed forward to get professional help. Over 50 NHS trusts now are using TRIM in some form and also 10 ambulance trusts. So this is a way of trying to make sure your staff who are doing a great healthcare delivery or, or healthcare support job also have some basic skills in how to actively monitor staff, which is very much in keeping with what the NICE guidelines on trauma say. NICE also, you would probably be aware, to say very clearly, do not do psychological debriefing. So the role for us mental health professionals is not to come in with our superman or superwoman outfits and save everybody. It's uh, because we know that doing that, debriefing them or critical incident stress debriefing them in the immediate period after a trauma actually doesn't help and actually makes things worse. Our role is to support teams to support themselves. And, and that's that's the crux here, is trying to get the team to support itself as much as they can. So the conclusion to, to my talk is that moral injury is not a mental illness. It is, however, linked with mental health disorders, including importantly in healthcare staff. Um, there's some groups who see more at risk and nursing staff, perhaps because they're more very much at the front line. Those who change roles and those who are exposed to more challenge to more COVID patients. Betrayal seems the most impactful form of, uh, of moral injury exposure. Um, so being let down by, by others who, who you should have trusted. 
Uh, most, nurses mostly feel that they've been let down by supervisors and doctors most feel that they've let down by people outside the health service. You know, but I, th I think the key thing here is that betrayal is something we can do something about by creating a meaningful narrative, but we have to, we have to know what we're targeting before we do that. Uh, and we know also that if you protect staff's mental health more generally, that's likely to help both generally with them, but also with moral injury as well. And what we need, as a researcher, I would say this, is we need, we've got some good ideas about how to prevent moral injury, but we do need more research work to make sure that what we're doing does uh, benefit and, and it doesn't do harm. And I think just to kind of finish on here is that what I've talked about here is about preventing moral injury and preventing mental health problems in healthcare workers. Also, aspirationally, we should be aiming to also in, try and create what's called post-traumatic growth. Because what we know is there's really good evidence that for most staff who go through these really morally challenging situations and come out the other side, actually, they don't become ill. In fact, they, they come through it and they think, well, do you know what, if I can cope with that, then what can't I cope with? So we're expecting to see an awful lot of post-traumatic growth out there. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, the media representations and the, the large amounts of studies that go on that over-report symptoms and suggest that the symptoms mean illness, which they don't always, sometimes makes us think that, you know, that, that, that there's a ticking time bomb or a tsunami of mental health problems out there. There absolutely will be a group of people who are gonna need professional care, I have no doubt. But we shouldn't forget that for many staff, actually what's happened over the last year and a half has challenged them, but will leave them thinking, actually, I, 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 I've come out of that better than I think, and I'm more resilient than I think. And, and that's something that we want to try and encourage, um, as well as obviously preventing mental ill health. So that's me. I will stop sharing and happy to join.